Um, I think you probably all know, hello, that I'm Max Horton. I'm the course leader of MA Photojournalism and Documentary Photography, and I'm really delighted to um, kind of announce the exhibition open uh, with this first talk in the Common Ground series. Um, this talk is called The Female Gaze, and we'll be discussing that interesting concept via the work of these amazing six women. Um, there's been an extraordinary Extraordinarily strong presence of work um, dealing with the, the, the female and non-binary um, experience. And so to be able to, to kind of highlight this um, straight off the bat is yeah, pretty amazing. Um, so the format of the talk is going to be um, six short uh, sort of three minutes just underlining three minute um, presentations from each of the, the wonderful students who I'm about to introduce. And then I'll ask a couple of questions by the time six of us have, or seven of us have answered those and discussed those, it's probably time for questions from, from you. Um, so we're going to divide it into little um, pairs. So the, the first, I'll just introduce everybody first of all. So Lena Gushi, uh, Abigail Faye, um, Zarifa Ahmed Zamri, um, who's going to speak with, um, oh, sorry, I got the order slightly wrong then, Sushil Schroeder, um, Christina Gao, and um, Sara Roman and Yako uh, are the six students. Uh, first of all, I'm going to hand over to Lena and Zarifa. Um, their work uh, deals, so they're not sitting together confusingly, Lena and Abigail are sitting together, <laughs> but Lena and Zarifa um, are going to kind of present uh, first of all with, with Lena, um, please, to, to go first. So they have documented the way in which the, the, the female body is circumscribed and controlled in respectively in terms of sexual violence um, on the streets and workplaces and in the homes of Cairo. Um, in Egypt, and uh, Zarifa's project is a, a personal project looking at the, the controls on sort of adolescence and young womanhood um, as she grew up in Saudi Arabia. So if I could hand over first of all to Lina, please, um, to present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Max. Um... Um, so yeah, my project is, um, is about um, sexual violence, as Max said, and um, it's uh, about the prevalence of sexual harassment and violence, um, which is obviously a universal issue. Uh, um, and at least in this chapter, I'm focusing on uh, women's stories about their experience in public and private spaces. Um, so in this project, I collaborated with um, women working on how they would like to be, um, how they would like to tell their stories and um, express it in writing. And um, I, I collaborated with women from different uh, ages, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds and different faith and um, I've been working on this project, project um, the last year, and um, I found it really um, personal and at the same time, like, socio-political. Um, it's personal because growing up in Egypt, personally, I experienced um, sexual violence in different forms, um, at work, on the streets, in my own home. So um, I think um, the issue is a sensitive one and it's very very uh, difficult to talk about and that's what I like to kind of approach in my practice and my work um, is to kind of bring bring up and discuss um, the difficult conversations that um, that even though like with all the Me Too movements and all the conversations going on um, like the, the, the culture of silence is still very, very existing, not only in Egypt, uh, but worldwide. Um, so I, um, in this phase of my project, it's, uh, like I said, it's mostly about the stories of women and their own experiences. Um, in later stages and chapters of this project, I'll be uh, exploring other layers um, like the media and law and how 
um, the culture, media, and law are going through this tension. Um, and even though, like, the law is uh, penalizing and and um, and catching up with all the what's going on, the the culture is still very much um, resistant to to that. And um, I think the conversation is not just between women. I think the conversation is also very inclusive, um, and we need to include men as well and like i was discussing with max just a couple of days ago like it's um, my project and and this conversation has to be um including men so yeah i i obviously can't take you through all of it but um if you would like to uh check out my project either head um down to elephanton castle or um just visit my website and you can know more about it Thanks very much. Brilliant. Um, and do head down to Elephant and Castle, but please use the very strict booking links um, available via my Instagram account um, in order to do so. Thanks very much, Lena. Um, if I could hand over to um, Zarifa, please. Obviously, we'll be talking about the projects in more detail afterwards. Zarifa. Hi. Um, yeah, let me just... Um, so I think I'm just going to run through my project um, a little bit before I show what I made for the um, project. But, um, so I grew up in Saudi Arabia, but my parents are from Malaysia. So we've always kind of um, had a status um, in Saudi and that impacted the way that I grew up with. Um, it sculpted the way that my parents raised me as they were always kind of cautious of following certain protocols um, in the government and certain norms. Uh, we grew up Muslim and I think even though Malaysia is a Muslim country, it was quite interesting to grow up in Saudi because it was a stricter protocol that my parents kind of conformed to traditional viewpoints, even if they didn't agree fully in their personal values. Um, so I created a and in it, I used um, family archives. I also did some set photos um, and some scans of um, objects from home. And it, I incorporated all these visual elements to kind of create a personal narrative of childhood memory and family relationships. My relationship with my family was um, shared in the scene as only um, a fragment of a bigger theme. So even though I explore home and identity, it's kind of related to much more bigger themes of gender segregation, gender roles. I grew up with um, two sisters. Um, my dad was the only male figure in my family, but it was pretty interesting to kind of transition from being a child to being an adult and kind of evaluating my childhood experiences um, and trying to fit my identity in certain gender roles and expectations. Um, I'm just gonna, I created this uh, video of my publication. Um, this is the book here. It's about 55 pages. Um, yeah. In 2018, um, women were allowed to drive um, in Saudi. And I think that really changed my life structure and my identity. I remember when I was young, I used to ask my parents to teach me how to drive, specifically my dad. Um, he was very open and very encouraging. He was always like encouraging us to study hard and he always envisioned us to live abroad. Um, but driving was always kind of on taboo because um, he was always questioning the logistics of it, asking where, what would you use driving for, what, how, and these kind of questions. And I think that really sculpted the way I thought about things because I think it came from a part, from a point of view where my dad had to kind of evolve from like being my caregiver, being my figure, parental figure. And, um, yeah, I think these experiences are quite important. And that's what I talk about is like the relationship between public um, changes such as the law and how that restructures um, societal and cultural values. So um, yeah, a lot of my work kind of speaks on issues and themes that.
Thanks very much, Sarifa. Really nice to see the zine um, in that way. Um, we're going to move on to um, the, the medical gaze um, via two works, uh, one by Abigail Fay and one by Susiel Schroeder, um, which are very prominent in the exhibition. Um, so yeah, both bodies of work, I would say, look at the, the ways in which women's bodies are misdiagnosed um, and ignored at, at the very level of, of kind of study by the medical profession. Um, the research is not um, present then and help is not available and so um, yeah both uh, Abigail and Sue Shields work seeks to bring a, a visibility to these incredibly important issues. Um, Abigail would you set us off please? Hi thanks Max. Yeah I'll we'll just share this. Okay. Um, Can you see that? Sorry? Can you see that? They can see it. Um, so this um, is a project that um, rose out of sort of a personal inquiry really after I had uh, breast cancer in 2019. Um, the result of which um, from the, the, the chemotherapy um, sent me straight into uh, menopause. And without really understanding what that meant, um, I realized that I can't possibly have been the only person that this would have happened to. And I was really struck by the lack of information that was given to me, the lack of um, support and um, treatment um, that was available. Um, and so I decided to use this as um, motivation to do some research and um, to do my projects on, on this subject. Um, and what I found was the data was quite uh, alarming, to say the least, um, in so much as menopause that happens to 51% of the global population and currently around 30 million women, non-binary and trans folk in the UK are currently going through menopause. Um, but we hear very little of it. There's, it's, it's only recently just come into discourse um, and there's, there's very little information that we're told about it. Um, it's not taught in schools and it's only um, recently been part of a campaign to be taught as a mandatory um, module in medical training, because within the six years that medics um, go through training, they uh, only get three hours of uh, medical training on menopause. Whereas erectile dysfunction, for example, that happens to men will come up frequently in um, medical training. And the disparity between um, men and women's uh, healthcare just gets wider um, as this goes on. So I looked at um, the history of, of the patriarchy in, in the medical system and how that's completely disenfranchised um, women and non-binary and trans folk as well, who also go, go through menopause, um, but don't, it, it doesn't really get spoken about. Um, so I needed to come up with a visual strategy in order to, um, to look at this work because it was very data heavy and I came up with um, the idea of making creating uh, data portraits for the people that I spoke to about their experience of early menopause um, and to do this oops oh, sorry I came up with um, a data key um, and a hand-drawn uh, illustration of a plant called black cohosh. So black cohosh is um, a phytoestrogen plant that is often used in supplements for women who are trying to negate their symptoms of menopause. And um, it's commonly used, but has very little, there's very little data to suggest it does anything to help um, with menopausal symptoms. And I'm using this as a, a metaphor for the medical system that lets uh, people down when it comes to menopause care. Um, and each of the elements on this um, on this illustration 
relate back to questions that I asked each of the people that I interviewed. Um, questions about their about their experience of menopause, and and with each piece of data that they sent me, it related to an element of this plant, which when put together, um, starts to grow and creates what's called a data portrait of each of each of the people that I I interviewed. Um, so on the left hand side here is the data portrait of this girl, um, Amy. And each of these people have got an animated film um, that shows the plant growing from the bulb upwards um, as each of the elements that relates to their experience starts to grow. So these are the people I interviewed. And it really speaks to the gap between the medical industry and the wellness industry, where the medical industry are, are letting um, women down in menopause care. The wellness industry are bridging that gap and um, allowing more and more products to be available um, on the market for women who have felt disenfranchised by their medical system and are looking for answers and solutions and they're looking to the wellness industry to bridge that gap and unfortunately the wellness industry are producing um supplements um that are have very little um effects on on menopause symptoms so women are being let down in both areas unfortunately So that's the project. Thanks very much, Abigail. Uh, so we're going to move on to um, Sushil's um, work, which is um, a body of work dealing with m maternal mental health, another um, under-discussed and uh, subject matter. So over to you. Are you still in the room, Sushil? I can't see you. Are you there, Sushil? I don't see, see Sushil right now. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, um, well, in the absence of Sushil temporarily, I hope you see this very important project with its reparative element of embroidery. Um, we'll move along to, um, to Christina, uh, please. Um, we're going to look at Christina and Sarah's work. Um, so Christina, if you could um, talk to us about your project on body image. Thank you very much. Okay, sure. Um, all right, so this is a project that is mainly about my body image. So to say it's mainly about the like the catharsis of my inner struggle was the perfection of my bodily image. And in this project, I represent some disembodied parts of my own body and I juxtapose them with the fragmented piece of this object. So we can see lots of illusions and symbolism here. So there are items like the petals of withered flowers, the dry and rotten fruits and peel, the fallen leaves. And the image I think are quite idyllic and poetic, but they're also quite metaphorical and elusive with, with, yeah, with the symbolism here. So I can show you some of the um, images in my project. And basically um, the, the close-ups here of the specific items are juxtaposed also with a narrative here. The narrative is basically written in my mother tongue and I also got an English version for each of them. So basically it's about the image that is paired with the narrative. So it's like a naturally flowing conversation I'm having with my own. And it's, it's about like my own struggle and my own exploration around the way. Cause initially I found it quite hard to accept myself as what I really am and I try to avoid seeing any imperfections or just some any small issues but later I just gradually came to accept that and I found that it's really a it's very therapeutic while doing this project because while seeking these items and just waiting for them to become kind of rotten or or dry and not that kind of perfect anymore but it's a state that I think that it's also quite beautiful to be photographed 
So yeah, because of time limit, I can't show you all of the narrative here, but yeah, just talk you through these images. And yeah, these are the items that I selected because I feel like there are some part related to my own body and they're kind of symbolic the moms. For example, the pomegranate is always like associated with the symbolism of like, fertility. Yeah. And I also want to ask my own question about what is the real like beauty ideal? Is there really a beauty ideal that exists? Kind of, I feel like our perspective of the world and ourselves is like consistently shaped by the innermost desires and the fear. So that is the two basic emotions that I have already um, figured out. And I want to deal with this kind of emotions in this project. And I want to ask about the questions. Yeah, so you can see from the, the way I photograph these symbolic items, I'm trying to ask about like whether there's a constantly changing relationship between the celebrated and the discarded, the glamorous and unappealing items. So yeah. Basically, that's the way I photograph these rotten items mm -hmm. in a quite symbolic way. And I also use some silverware to further glorify, sorry, to glorify to celebrate these items. And the transience of youth and beauty um, is disturbingly contrasted with the inevitable decay and disease. That is what can be felt from these images. So I further connect these images with my own body and I somehow feel that in the end, my body could merge with all these items displayed on the table. Like kind of, we are very um, similar in some way. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That's basically um, what I have to tell. It's a really personal story. It's about my own exploration, but I hope that somehow it can rouse yeah, similar feelings from the audience and yeah, so basically this is my project. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Christina. And it's interesting that you use the word therapeutic because um, as we now do have Sushil um, <laughs> unkicked out of, of Zoom, um, we'll go to Sushil's project, which um, looks at kind of uh, both sides of the um, the kind of the horror and, and the therapeutic side of, of things in terms of maternal mental health. Over to you, Sushil. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Um, yes, so I've made um, some work called That Which Goes Unsaid Unravels. Um, and I'll just share my screen with you so that you can see um, some of the work that we're at. That was me trying to figure out how to get back on here. Oh, I am screen sharing. There we go. Oh, sorry. Let's see. There we go. Sorry. Okay. okay. Um, so it's a, a a series of portraits that examines and addresses the maternal mental health crisis in the UK, um, where sort of between one hundred and sixty and two hundred thousand women a year will be diagnosed with a perinatal mental health condition, and the numbers of women who are suffering with the symptoms of a condition but don't feel comfortable talking about it to any kind of health professional or even sort of friends or family more. Um, uh, mean that those numbers are sort of grossly underrepresentative of, of the women experiencing these uh, challenges as they experience the perinatal period, which is pregnancy through to up to a year postnatally. Um, and it was sort of um, a work that came together personally for me because of my own personal experiences of um, perinatal mental health condition, but all, also through my work as a portrait photographer, I'm frequently meeting mums and as I'm photographing them with their babies, they've recently had this perinatal experience and they often have these very big experiences to talk about. Um, but they all, uh, many of them tell me, you know, this is the first time I've really spoken about it. And I felt like when they are talking about it, they're almost unraveling in the sense that they are finally letting it out and it's, it's cathartic. So I wanted to create a portrait series that helped us visualize sort of the identities behind these statistics. And these are only 10 of the, as I mentioned, 200,000 women that go through this. But I, I do think it's important that we see names and faces of the people that are going through this. So um, I'll just roll through. I probably won't be able to stop enough time for you to read the, the captions there, but um, I can send a link to some more information on it if, um, if you'd like to see more. So I took these portraits um, with these women in a studio setting. It was a really simple setup. Um, and the idea was that then I could continue to take them 
uh, going forward so that it becomes an ongoing um, portrait series sort of indefinitely that just continues to uh, visualize women who, who are um, going through these sorts of things. Uh, in the long term, I would love this project to become something that sort of brings women together in the period after they um, had children or after pregnancy um, in sort of a peer to peer support group format. Uh, in order to test that out, I, um, I got the women together after they'd been photographed and asked them to embroider their, their images while we were together um, in sort of a therapeutic session, um, which as Max alluded to, is was quite reparative in its um, ability to sort of bring these women together and have them take ownership of their image um, by adorning it or interfering with it, um, breaking through it physically with a needle and thread to create something that gave their image, um, sort of took away um, my power as a photographer, sort of photographing them and, and, and let them take the identity of their image back. Um, so they were allowed to, um, embroider the image as they wished. And um, so everything, every sort of aspect of it is unique. I included my own photograph because I do think that, and as an important aspect of the female gaze that we're discussing, being able to have empathy um, towards, you know, women and birthing people that have these experiences by virtue of my own experiences, I think puts me in a unique position over perhaps a man who may not have experienced things like this. Um, so that's why I thought it was important to make myself part of the work too. Um, I don't know if you've ever come across um, a documentary by the documentarian Louis Theroux, but he made the only widely available British documentary about maternal mental health. And um, quite unfortunately, it's deeply troubling and exploitative, but that's, you know, I can go on about that for a long time, but it was interesting as it was a discussion about something very unique to women and birthing people that have had these experiences. But here was a man in a mother and baby unit where women had been sectioned for being at harm, for being at risk to harming themselves or their babies. And at the very sort of extreme end of a vast spectrum of maternal mental health conditions. And by profiling women that were experiencing something so extreme and so troubling, um, I think its result was to make women feel more uncomfortable to talk about it. I know that as I watched it, even with sort of a wider perspective on this topic, that I thought, God, this, I, I feel like I can't tell anyone about this. What if they think that I want to harm my baby like the women in this program? And so I can only imagine how many women that that made feel like the stigma attached to maternal and mental health is just as prevalent now as it was 50 years ago. Um, so it's it's been important for me to to be part of the work too. Um, and I think the women that uh, the women that participated after spoke about sort of embroidering the image and taking some ownership of it as being quite therapeutic and having that space to discuss with one another um, their experiences was um, was useful. So I hope that I can continue it going forward and it can start making some at least some small contribution to reducing the stigma of maternal mental health and also helping to visualize the vast spectrum of women that will go will go through it. You know, it'll be women that will cross you in the street, live next door to you. It's 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 not always the most extreme of cases and it's okay to talk about it. So um, yes, thank you very much. I'll go back to you, Max. Thanks very much, Tisha. Uh, so last but absolutely definitely not least, um, hopefully still in the room is Sarah. Uh, and Sarah is going to talk with us about the um, the, the ongoing and essential need for um, a room of one's own, as Virginia Woolf memorably said. Over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Hello. Hi, thanks. Um, so let me just share my screen. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, as, as, um, as Max mentioned, my room is largely well inspired by um, Woolf's um, A Room of One's Own text, uh, seminal central text of like feminist literature, I guess uh, everybody knows it. Um, and I wanted to concentrate on, it's very simple at its core, the project. It's a, a list, well, a range of girls and women as they grow up um, and they are their own rooms. So they're bedrooms in this case, um, in, a, in a way of like, at its core, it's it's a safe space. It's an analysis of a safe space. It's It's also a sort of, game that I've tried to play, um, tried to see if 
one's bedroom or one's space tells uh, something more about um, about one's external identity and external how how they present themselves to the world. Um, it's a strongly strongly feminist uh, work, but it's also uh, sort of stemmed by my nosiness and my curiosity about actually getting to know um, women, women's story and women's spaces. Um, yeah. And so, well, the work that I've printed actually is mainly just portraits and bedrooms. I wanted to have that visual, very strong link between one's, again, one's external identity and the bedrooms. Uh, but I've included here also the objects because actually the project was born, I don't know, Max, if you remember, but as I was conceptualizing the project, um, I wanted to concentrate on the gendered object and how, well, we live in a very like dual and gendered society, right? And that reflects a lot in the objects. So we've got like, the traditional like pink for boys and the girls and blue for boys and uh, the very feminine objects um, um, for women and whatnot. Um, and so of course that's influenced from by gender identity, gender roles and binaries. Um, but then in turn, it also influences the very strict gender uh, roles that we, we were forced into. Um, and then slowly I realized how it's, it's a bit boring to, to concentrate solely on objects and it's not really um, the objects that make a person in a way, um, but then it was it was quite difficult to understand how to portray a person. These are all girls and women that I don't actually know. So actually, interestingly enough, the youngest one, her name is Clemmy, she's eight. Um, and the second one, Talula, 17, they're Abigail's kids. Um, which was lovely actually to have this collaboration. These are basically the next generation of, well, feminists. Talula is strongly feminist. Uh, well done to the mom, I guess, raising them well. Um, and it's it's just been very, very difficult to, to portray them as they truly are really, um, because this is only my, how I see them, how I understand them, right? I've spent, what like maximum three hours with most of these women and um in my final work I actually included also text of descriptions of how i see them and how what their room tells me about them in a way um for example this is julie this is the only girl around my age she's 22 and what really really shocked me was this girl me and her hit it off immediately we have so similar and i walk into a room and it's just so empty i was i was shocked um, cause mine is just an explosion. Well, it's really chaotic too, but, um, it's just colors everywhere. And then slowly I started snooping around and I realized how every single object is intertwined so, so deeply with her own identity. For example, well, that's Mr. Hedgehog, a very creative naming <laughs> she gave him. Um, that's a gift from her mom, but then, and she actually pointed this out to me every walking me through her room. Um, and that's actually that someone, something that everyone every single one of the participants did they were so proud and interesting to show me around their rooms which i wasn't expecting i had to like actually tell them oh look i'm not like a pervert trying to like snoop into your underwear drawer or something uh, but but they were actually really really um welcoming and they showed me the corners I was like oh you want to watch like look whatever you want um so well the books of course again sylvia plath very um very feminist her, her too but everything she owned was tied to her identity and her relationships and her the people that she loves. Um, the same with her, her name is Cecilia, she's 41, and she has so, so many strong passions. And I mean, I knew at the moment I saw her, she likes vintage and whatnot, but even the moment I stepped into her room, I immediately knew, you know, she loves dancing, she loves makeup and very feminine um, stuff. And that's also a thread that I wasn't really expecting um, because I walked into it with a lot of expectations and a lot of like well, hoping to break a lot of um, expectations I had about gender. I was like, oh, a lot of these women probably won't have a very feminine room, but then actually they did. Um, and what does actually that say about feminism and a feminist identity and how that reflects, like look at the heart-shaped heart hats, you know? Um, the pink flamingos, the flowers for her hair. Um, and that's the same actually for Sharon, Sharon is 60. She's very, very devout, very religious, um, but very simple looking. And then you walk into her room and she has a collection of perfumes, which by the way, are also the sweetest perfumes I've ever smelled in my life. Um, she's got her teddy bear. She's got, 
like there's so many similarities with amongst these women, despite their ages and their backgrounds and whatnot. Um, yeah, and that was just the most interesting aspect of it all, I guess. Some aspects of this project are still actually hidden to me. Um, as people see it, they they tell me what they interpreted out of it, and and it it's it's literally unveiling in front of my eyes as I'm like looking at it because I went went into it without many expectations, many ideas, and yeah, I'm just learning so much um, about my own project basically. Um, yeah, that's it pretty much it Thank thanks you. very much Sarah um I was struck by the fact that of, of the approaches yours is the um the the most what we might call straight documentary and it's almost like if if we had this simplicity if, if every woman in the world had the simplicity of, of what it actually symbolically means to have a room of, of one's own that that is to 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 have agency in in the world then all of these other projects and and you know the, the strategies that everyone else is using to kind of bring these incredibly important debates into discourse they you know they might not be so necessary because all everything would be visible and a lot of the work that's that's being done in in the other works is trying to make the things that have long been invisible, visible. Thank you so much, everyone, for your really interesting presentations. Um, this is such a, I'm so glad that you're sort of having this experience of talking about your work publicly as well. For some of you, I know it's for the first time and, and none of you seem nervous at all, you are fab. I just also want to acknowledge the amazing people in the room, some are current students on the course who have also produced extraordinary work about women. I can see Alicia is here and Rose and Nieves um, and, and other amazing students who um, from, um, other years. Um, I see Anna, whose feminist work is sort of unforgettable, and Claire, um, and everyone else in the room that I know, I've also produced amazing work, but we're sticking to women. We will now talk about the female gaze. Um, so I'm often sort of asked to talk about what the female gaze is. And I think that the first thing that I think, but I'm much more interested in what you guys think, is that it's this, exactly the same phraseology as the male gaze. And so are we at risk of, to, to slightly misquote Audre Lorde, but uh, of using the master's tools to dismantle the master's house if um, we, we say we are using the female gaze? Um, obviously female is a binary term. And I, I, I think that um, a female, that doesn't mean that a female gaze can't be pluralist. And I think in, in the work that we've seen today, um, you know, that there, there, there obviously is that um, leaning towards a, a plural pluralism. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in what you think about the, the term um, a female gaze and, and if you think that it has a kind of agency, if, it, if it's time to, to, to talk about this and to, to change the, the, the patriarchal male gaze, but by using um, this this term does it help to strategize your work through the concept of the female gaze? That's open to you. anyone. Go ahead, Sarah. I was actually just thinking about that as I was speaking because, well, yeah, the moment you put things in a binary, right, you sort of put them against each other, and the thing with the female gaze, it's it's really hard to define, I guess, because it's not as much as a lot of people misinterpret it as soft and oh like you know feminine and whatnot and uh, pretty and soft-spoken gaze um that's that's a big discourse actually coming up uh, with like movies by women's director and whatnot um that oh the moment they've got like a man in a flowery shirt oh that's a female gaze because it's soft so, not, not really um but it, yeah it's very difficult difficult to define right because I don't I still don't know if I'm a woman I mean I'm definitely a woman in the sense that you know I'm menstruate I've I've got like an ovary and a, and a uterus that are, are ready to pop out kids or whatnot but really I don't know what the experience of being a woman and a female is if not described by so because I was socialized to be a woman and a female I don't know what it means to be that in in the society and largely what that means is actually patriarchal violence so as Lena was mentioning catcalling and all these experiences and actually I really enjoyed all the, your presentations because I was like oh my god yeah that happened to me too blah, blah, blah. and that's also what a female gaze is right it's translating your own experience and your own personal also trying to give trying to understand and trying to give meaning to your own personal life and how 
you go about life being socialized as a woman and as a in a patriarchal society where truly you're not important you know we're made to be feel as not the core of a society um mm -hmm. Abigail, you're nodding <laughs> I think it's um it's really interesting and, and some of the things that I've had to to kind of confront in in my own project is is a sense of internal misogyny um it's having to confront the fact that I have been participating in um that kind of behavior because it's a learned behavior so like Sara was was saying quite often we will be complacent um, and complicit with this because it's something that we've learned growing up and and for me the female gaze is something that is I suppose is confronting that as well because what it's doing is is um, bringing that to the front and 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 allowing you to to look at where you've probably been complicit in 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 these areas as well um so i think that's one of the things that i found with with my project um in particular is is that i've had to to confront my own belief system um about what it is to be a woman um and and how that can potentially um influence my my children for example um so it's 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 an interesting sort of place to be because i think we haven't really, really been given the space for a female gaze yet to even work out what that really is yeah thank you i mean if some of the work for you know for example rosa's work who isn't in this conversation but is is, is on the course and um, is a participant here you know that she has an, an image um from a miscarriage i've never seen an image like that in my entire life how is that possible to, to get to the age that I've got to know the women I've known and to never have seen an image like that? So, so that's pretty uh, extraordinary, I think. Yeah, and, and also I think I've been questioning the, the idea of, of the female gaze. I was asked to write about the work of Yushi Lee. She's a recent RCA graduate. Um, and you know, and that that question kind of, of crops up, and um, lots of people have looked at her work. Her project's called My Tinder Boys, um, and people have assumed that it was uh, a guy, a gay guy, taking those images. Because um, would would an, uh, an Asian woman be desirous of um, a, a white Western kind of boy without a six pack? And just it's just so complicated. And yeah, I, I want to use the term um sort of as it's useful does anyone else want to comment on on the female gaze before we move on yeah yeah so i mean we... i just wonder if then <laughs> um yes um yeah i'm just wondering if like labeling um the work is actually inclusive or isolating to to men and that's why i sort of leave it like open to everyone. Um, I mean, it's definitely important to be aware of the female gaze, and that's extremely um, um, important. And I just wonder, like, whether that's inviting or re repelling. And I don't have an answer for that. It's just like <laughs> an open question. Yeah, absolutely. And who, who comes to a talk called the female gaze? anyway yeah i mean how many <laughs> men are in this talk just just out of curiosity i think stephen hello stephen <laughs> one <laughs> <laughs> i mean i mean thank you stephen for being here uh, but that proves my point um i i think the term is useful for 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 the sake of being self-aware as women but but I'm not sure we're supposed to having the conversations just with with each other. Hmm. Thank you, Lina. Zerifa. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was like, I'm going to go back to the point. I feel like what I really like about working with the female gaze is it's a chance to kind of equalize certain issues. So. I think uh, as women, we're brought up to follow certain protocol, certain gender roles, and these things, um, even if it's, I'm not talking just about specifically um, biological gender, I'm just talking about social constructs. I think it's really interesting because um, 
we're categorized as oh this is a female category you know like so when we're allowing feminists to talk about their work people kind of categorize it as like okay I shouldn't contribute to it because this is a female space but I think the best way is to work towards a goal where we can equalize our work where it's like we need to confront these issues first and say like as women we're not given the same opportunity we're not given the same perspective but I feel like the goal is to kind of view us as equals but I think we need to confront these issues for these social constructs first thank you indeed um Sushil or Christina do you want to respond to the, the female gaze question oh yes um just briefly talk about my own feelings I feel like it's kind of a very spontaneous and innate reaction for me. So it's not just intentionally wanting to confront the like the male gaze or yeah, the similar one, but I feel like it's it's really spontaneous. It's like something I feel like I should do. And probably that's what female gaze really mean because I feel like we are more empathetic towards yeah, the female as a group. So what I'm trying to express in the project could be more universal and it could represent the collective experience of more females yeah so i think i feel like we have kind of identical identical experiences and i feel like so that is the kind of the way i want to do it yeah and what i want to say mm -hmm. thank you very much christina sushil uh yeah just briefly just um actually echoing a little bit of what christina said that i think it's something that we perhaps do more subconsciously than we might be aware of so for me i wasn't really conscious of it being a sort of a topic of female gaze that work, even though obviously innately it is, but I think it's um, just the growth in um, sort of, especially the documentary space of female photographers and especially in the maternal art space, which is also growing quite rapidly. It's maybe because as photographers, we're trying to, we're holding up a mirror to our own experiences and creating work around that. And because there are more women creating work now, there is a growth of that body of work that is, you know, somewhat a product of the female gaze. But I think it's right that we have to make sure that it doesn't exclude, um, you know, other people from perceiving the work and, and not thinking that they are separate from it and therefore don't need to consume it in any sort of way. Thank you. And we also need to keep a sharp eye on, on where the, these kinds of works, you know, there, there is a, you know, a, a huge uh, number of, of amazing um, female and non-binary artists making work now. But back to the kind of the Gorilla Girls question from two decades ago, who's getting the solo shows? And so we need to, to remain vigilant um, about, about that kind of thing. Um, I just would like to ask you a, a question about the kind of the, the visual strategies, um, I think, that you used um, before we perhaps get some questions from the audience. I mean, I, I'm aware we're going to run a little bit over, but we did start a little bit late and I just want you to have a little bit of a chance um, to, to, to speak a bit more about your work. But you know, some super interesting strategies from embroidery to data portraits to, to still life. And, and with Zarifa's work, it was predominantly a zine, which is a strategy in itself because it's very kind of tactile um, thing that you, that you touch. And also it's kind of lo-fi, which I thought would perhaps appeal to a, maybe a particular generation, but it's just kind of low key, whereas some of the, oh, at least the Saudi slash American image that I'm familiar with is kind of big and bold and your, your zine is kind of, yeah, I'm gonna use the term lo-fi again, which is in itself an aesthetic strategy. And as I said, Sarah's um, strategy to use kind of straight um, portraiture documentary photography is also um, a strategy. But yeah, do any of you want to talk about your um, your particular um, aesthetic strategy? Oh, sorry, Lena, um, your very particular um, gold um, uh, erasures and your writing. Um, sorry, I hadn't got that written down in my notes, but obviously, yes, another um, very strong visual strategy. So if anyone would just like to, to speak to that idea and, and why, yeah, you decided to to use it to, to, to bring um, a visibility to your subject. Oh, um, yeah, I, um, sorry, just a second. Um, I mean, um, I, I do believe very much in the power of text and image. And uh, for me, like with such a sensitive topic and very heavy one and very vulnerable, um, I felt like it's really important for each and every woman and, and, and girl I, I, I spoke to that her story is being told by, by her and her voice is heard. And um, it wasn't up to me whether they would like to show their identity or not. Um, I just chose the gold because 
often like when people conceal identity by blurring it out or just erasing the, the whole face, I found it a bit aggressive. And I chose gold because in a lot of cultures, gold is of kind of um, elevates. And, and that was my strategy to, to elevate. Um, these women are survivors and they're very brave and courageous for telling their stories and for um, sharing it with, with each other. And I found it extremely important to avoid any um, sort of negative narrative going on. And that's why um, the usage of gold and um, the layer text with the image, because they had to go hand in hand. And I think they kind of augment each other in a way. And I, sorry, go on. sorry, I mean, some other women chose to reveal their identity. And that was also um, achieved by connecting with the gold element in, in the two different types of images. Thank you. Because you used the word elevate, I'd like to go to, to Christina, um, who also talked about um, elevating um, in, in a similar way. Would you just talk a little bit about the still life aesthetic that you use? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, I personally like the like Dutch paintings, especially um, like the Dutch painting in the Renaissance age. So um, so my still life, actually, it's like reminiscent of those um, painting that or the Vanitas paintings. So basically the Vanitas have a main theme, which is memento mori, which means it's a Latin word for remember you must die. So it's kind of very symbolic and haunting at, yeah, at a sense, but it's kind of reminds us of the transience of beauty and youth. And I feel like it somehow could be more associated with my own feelings when I see my own body. So somehow I think I could associate this paintings of the still life with my own body images and that's why I just incorporate this kind of tactics and I feel like it's it's really very just like what I said it's very therapeutic seeing those items being glorified <laughs> using yeah my own way to glorify them and celebrate them I think yeah it's a way to for me to question the standards of ideal beauty and to construct the um, interpretations of my own Thank you. Sushil, the history of embroidery, of, of storytelling, of, of, of all of those things. Could you speak a little bit about, about that stage of your project, please? Yeah, so um, I was really fascinated about the, um, the nature of, it was, uh, I, I suppose I used embroidery thread and th um, as a convenient analogy to a term that's used often in sort of maternity care parlance which is you know you must knit yourself back together after pregnancy you must knit yourself back together which i just think is quite interesting because we have this perception of sort of fiber arts of of knitting of coming together in those circles as sort of being you know this iconog you know it's an iconography of, of repressed domesticity it was something women did pre-50s and and we've sort of evolved from that we don't want to be seen to be doing those things anymore but there are lots of uh, circumstances in history where those environments have been used to empower women you know in what World War II, female spies would weave code into their knitting and send it off. And, you know, because they were just women knitting, no one assumed they were doing anything, um, you know, more than that. So um, I think it has a place in history that's very interesting. I wanted to use it for my project because I had those perceptions myself and I wanted to challenge them. But I did think it was interesting about the concept of using fiber arts as a means of, of coming together as a group and, and having something to do while you're doing that, which makes difficult conversations easier in a way and it just gave us a reason to come back together which wasn't just let's have these very difficult conversations it was let's create something and and take some ownership of our of our image and i used a very classical portraiture aesthetic um which was quite homogenous for the reason that it would then present this embroidery as something unique on top of an image that sort of had some consistency with each other um and just to sort of highlight the gaze of experience of the participants so you were looking beyond sort of what they may have been wearing or how they were sitting or what they've been photographed in front of in sort of a more environmental portrait aesthetic to just looking at their expression and, and what that tells you about what they'd experienced and what they chose to embroider as a as a result. Yeah, super interesting. Thank you. And, and Abigail, you spoke a little in your presentation about the, the data portraits, but um, just perhaps why you weren't satisfied with, with simply the portrait and just what led to that, that very particular um, form of learning that you took upon yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, when I spoke to one of the, the, the uh, participants of my project, um, she did um, 
she did talks in uh, the workplace about menopause. And when I spoke to her about what she found was the most, um, that, that appealed to her audience the most and that had the most impact was the data. Um, and because the project that I was working on was quite data heavy, um, I decided to use that um, as part of the motivation to, to create a different type of portraits um, to look at. Um, I suppose it sort of challenges that um, sort of photojournalistic approach of just producing a portrait in order to tell a story. And I didn't feel like the portraits that I was taking told the full story. And actually each of these people's stories has grown and um, has developed um, over a number of years. Um, and it felt like they were too complex to really just interpret in one image. And so looking at data portraits as a way of sort of visualizing um, their testimonies seemed like um, a good strategy really to emphasize how much information um, and the difficulties that they've been through um, and sort of illustrating that um, made sense actually to produce something slightly different in order to to kind of convey the issues thank you and and just um my my final question to to all of you before we reach out to see if there are any any questions but i just want to talk about activism and the extent to which um you you feel like your your work is any kind of form of of activism or or if not, I guess, brackets, the sense in which you want it to be public um, and, and, to, and to share it, if anyone would like to, to speak to that. And maybe Sarah or Zarifa, just because we didn't speak to you just then, Sarah? I don't know if Zarifa wants to go first. Um, I think she had something to say before. Oh, well, to... Whatever you'd like to address, Zarifa. Yeah. Go <laughs> I'll be quick, but I was just thinking about it, right? I, I realized that with all of our works, it's the mere act of like, well, the thing that ties it together is, I think, the coming out and saying it about the theme that we're touching. Um, for example, like, well, the body image, a scene that comes to mind is the really funny, like, mean girl scene where they're, like, standing in front of the mirror and they're like, oh, my pores are huge, my cuticles are disgusting. <laughs> and they, like, you're supposed to hate yourself and your body, but you're not really supposed to hate the fact that you hate your body. Like, and when you do get work done, you, you can't say it, blah, blah. And of course, the same with like sexual violence. Oh, you can't say that that happened to you because otherwise, you know, like, oh, but what were you wearing? What were you doing? Um, and then while miscarriage, Rose isn't here, but her work about miscarriage and everything relating to maternity, it's very much, oh, that happened. I'm not going to say it. Blah, blah, or I can't. Or, or literally just amongst women, um, you're not supposed to talk about it. Like, it's just you just got to accept it and go on. Um, in my case, I feel like my work is a bit more mon mundane. It's it's pretty much just you know a bedroom, um, not to like push it down. But I I don't I'm not really sure it's activism in a sense. But I think that just the mere fact of like talking about it and having it like blasted visually on a wall. Um, in the case of Sushil's work, in a huge A1 print on a wall, um, it's honestly activism in itself. Uh, I think. That's it. I think. Thank you. Well I said. Sorry, but Sarah, I, I think your work is quite. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm 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 just gonna say something quickly. I think Sarah's work is actually um, protesting the idea of um, like um, putting women in a box that the room should be a certain way, or that um, their 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 um, in their their private spaces have to look a certain way. So I think that's really important and, and the whole thing with colors and, and what's expected, the flowers and all of that. So in a way, like it's kind of um, going against this idea that a lady or a woman's room have to be presented in a certain way. Um, yeah, and for me, I mean, Zarifa, you can go first. <laughs> Thanks, and back to you, lady. That's great. Yeah, I have two points. Um, the first point is like, I do think that all of our works are um, activism in itself. Like, for example, um, Sarah's work, like, I feel like the way that we speak about our projects is really important because even though visually it looks like just bedrooms and portraits, but I feel like there's a different agency to it and there's a different theme 
behind why you're doing it. And I think as women, we're still fighting to be seen as equal. So I think it's always gonna be of activism. And um, yeah, so that was my first point. My second point is um, Max mentioned that um, my zine is quite condensed compared to all the bigger themes that I'm talking about. And I think the reason why is because I'm so used to um, people, whether it's the government or my family or strangers, kind of telling me what to do and telling me this is how you should act, you can't do th th these things. And I think in a way it's like, this is a memoir, this is my life experience and no one else can kind of dictate that. And I think the reason why I put it in a book was because I felt like it's my life on a, on a, on a thing. And I think, um, I really wanted to kind of reclaim that experience and reclaim that position that I have of, um, you know, I'm a girl and I was born this way, I was raised this way, but this is how I feel and this is what I believe in. And I think in its way, it's just powerful in its own. It sure is, that's, yeah, that's fab. Thank you, Zrifa, I very, very much enjoyed that. Um, yeah, would anyone else like to, to speak to this idea of, of activism? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Lena, please do. I mean, for me, actually, um, my work is very much driven by wanting to hopefully create some social change and a different way of, of, of having a con I mean, it starts with conversations, right? So just like having these conversations amongst each other as women and also with men, um, with all men from different ages, from different backgrounds and just like having that conversation is a start to social change. Um, and I know a lot of people um, are talking about it. Um, the Me Too movement started, I don't know how many years ago, like it's probably more than five years ago. Um, but I wonder to what extent is, is, is the public conversation reflected in the private life and um, in, on our own actions as women and, and as men. Um, so my work is very much about protesting sexual violence in solidarity with other women. My work is a protest to me being gaslit for years, for being abused and for being sexually violated. Um, so my work is very much about um, creating some social change and, and, and being active and trying to slowly, slowly change the status quo. So yeah. Sorry for the rant. <laughs> yeah, not a rant. No, absolutely not a rant. And and Abigail and Cecil, your work is kind of pushing towards kind of yeah, po policy change. Would would you say? Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think with with um, my work in particular, I suppose my sort of prime audience, I suppose, would be those in, within the medical space, um, and asking and confronting them and asking them to really consider um, how they go about collecting medical knowledge on women's bodies. And I suppose um, one of the issues that, that has been so prevalent in, in the work that I've been doing is that the majority of the research that's been done hi historically has been done around the male body as a default. And that really needs to change. In order for us to create change further down the line, what really needs to happen is that women's bodies need to become equal to men's in terms of research so that in the medical space that the, the, the problems that are affecting our bodies that aren't affecting men's bodies are equally as important. Um, and so my work is really, it is a piece of activism in that respect because I am, there's an inquiry there as to why this isn't happening and when it can happen. Um, and I think that's really important. Absolutely, yeah, thank you, Sisha. Oh, sorry, and then Sarah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and just following on from that, um, in sort of the maternity space, um, before you have a child, the focus of the national, of the health service is of course on you and your sort of safety and well-being and your health. And then suddenly you have this child and, and it's actually so interesting how that care transfers directly to this child and stops being about you at all. And so, 
that's how so many women fall through the cracks of not being addressed, not having their symptoms considered, not being asked the right questions so that their condition can be diagnosed. I mean, I put out a survey on um, social media as part of creating this work and 89% of respondents said that they didn't feel like the health professional conducting the only touch point that women have with a doctor or a GP or a midwife after giving birth, which is sort of the six to eight week postnatal check. 89% um, of women thought that the person conducting that had no genuine interest in their mental health. So how many women are not saying what they want to say or explaining how they feel? And I do feel that this work is in some ways activism because it just makes me so angry that there are so many women experiencing this. There is insufficient resources. You know, the government are now talking they in, in the last, you know, the recent budget, they said they're dedicating a hundred million pounds towards maternal mental health. And, um, the next five years and it's just that's not even going to touch you know the tip of the iceberg of the women that are in such awful positions especially after giving birth during the pandemic which i mean some of the conditions that women gave birth in there are comparable to i don't know a battlefield hospital it's awful so i do think this is a, a work of activism and i hope it continues in that way and affects some kind of even if it just makes someone speak to someone else about how they feel i feel like that for me is uh, is a sufficient response to it. Thank you. Um, Sarah, did you want to come in there? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, well, I typed in this question, but then I realized I sent it to the technical team. So the, sorry, guys, it wasn't meant for you. It was meant for everyone, but <laughs> I'm just going to like come out and say it <laughs> by voice. Um, that Well, now I feel stupid because Sushil made such an important point. Uh, the fact that most of our works were made, I guess, out of anger like and frustration. But the contrary is also true in the sense that sometimes or maybe it's only true for me, I don't know, you guys can let me know if it's true, but we get trapped in this having to do work because it ha must have meaning or just like be given this deeper meaning to our works just because it's been made from a woman, by a woman or for women. It's like, okay, yes, but sometimes also our work, not in this case, because of course the themes that we touch are, are quite important, but um, it's also interesting to like see the contrary point being like, okay, but sometimes work is just work made because someone wanted to be made and you're giving it maybe more meaning than it has to just because it, it was a woman that made it um again of course this in our case it's our experiences of life and whatnot but sometimes other projects are way more simpler but yeah just an interesting thank you and and christina your work kind of doesn't look like activism but it comes from the you know the, this very strong feeling that we are meant to be perfect and i don't know if that i'm putting words into your mouth that it comes from social media from advertising from the the, the media more, more generally so it might not look like activism but it, it's doing its work isn't it yeah so that's what i also hope it will work like that it's not meant to be an activism work but i just hope it can kind of uh, make you associate yeah with the experiences of yourself so that's why i think it could be a more universal it could kind of deliver a more universal issue yeah yeah thank you so much i mean so please if, if anyone um would like to um to ask a question do and while i don't i don't actually see any questions um here so i just wanted to sort of say something about i'm sort of imagining a woman who's who's experienced sexual violence who was misdiagnosed with with something to do with you know may, maybe menopause who was put under a system of control who was made to feel that her body wasn't good enough who suffered with mental health after giving birth um you know that 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 woman if, if all those things happen to one woman which it could or, or you know imagine if that happened to to kind of most men i just feel like it's a lot it's a lot um to that we all carry um and yeah when when you look at it as a whole it's not to say that there aren't you know it reparative strategies there aren't ways of healing um but yeah we women shouldn't be in this position so that sounds quite angry to you but yeah i'm quite angry <laughs> as well as quite joyful. Um, we should draw it to a close, but um, Lena, do you want to um, say something? No, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you all. Um, it's really amazing to, to be part of this and to, to have these conversations together. And uh, hopefully we can have one 
collective exhibition about that. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, I think you know, do, doing this and again with some of the people who um, who are um, listening to to us um, and who, who know about this work. There's just some yeah extraordinary work going on and I'm really glad that you guys have had the chance to speak so incredibly eloquently. Thank you uh, for that at the end of, of quite a long week. Um, and please to anyone who's, who's still listening, please do book and come and see the show. And oh, do you, if you guys want to put your websites into the chat, if you just want to do that before we kind of sign off here. Um, and thank you very much to everyone for coming. And thanks very much to the AV team for <laughs> sticking with us at that slightly sticky bit at the beginning and to the event team as well. And yeah, to, to, to all of you and to all of MAPJT. Great, is that everyone? We all done that? Okay, thanks very much everyone. We'll sign off. Thank you. Bye-bye, good night. Bye.